Good evening. So good to see everybody here tonight. So we begin, I want to thank some people. Uh, because VBS happened yesterday, and I can promise you that if it were just me, it would not have happened. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there, I've tried to write down everybody who I could remember, and I know I forgot several people, I'm sure. So if you are one of the ones I forgot, please come up to me after. Feel free to hit me on the arm, just on the arm, anywhere you want. <laughs> no, uh, but please accept my apology now uh, if I've forgotten you. But I wrote down everybody I could think of who came to the work day, that kind of thing. So I just want to go through this list really quickly. And it's not in any particular order, just the order that they came to mind. So first of all, Tarina, thank you for coming to the work day last, last week. And Ken and Don, man, Y'all did so much <laughs> these past few weeks, and, and Ken and Kyle were amazing magistrates yesterday uh, in acting out Act 16. It was terrifying. They had swords and everything. Um, you wouldn't have wanted to see No. <laughs> um, and then Becky, co-teaching with Don, just a great job in their classroom, looked awesome. Uh, it looked incredibly uninviting. It was a jail, <laughs> so somewhere you'd not want to go. And Carrie Lee just absolutely did everything over the past couple weeks. She was amazing. Um, and Callie also, right along with Carrie Lee, just doing so much. And their classroom looked amazing. It looked incredibly welcoming. It looked like a nap room. So it was fantastic. I went in there after, no, <laughs> went in there after VBS just hung out. Um, Rebecca for coming to the work day. And Jim and Tawny for stepping up and teaching. They, they came to the work day to work. And we were missing teachers for a class. And they said, well, we'll do it. So uh, they, they taught and they did it amazing. Um, their classroom looked really fun, so um, I'm so thankful for them. And Missy and Wendell just doing so much also over the past couple weeks. And Wendell was an amazing rich guy in the skit yesterday, <laughs> pulled it off great, um, and paying off Ken and Kyle, so they're corrupted also. Um, Lou and Jean, and Lou doing so much for the food, and Jean helping us and, and uh, setting out all the decorations and stuff, and just being by her side. And Linda, Linda does so much around here that not everybody sees, but she is always working for the church here. She did so much for the BBS. Troy, wherever you're at, Troy. Troy was an amazing group leader yesterday. He was, uh, he was cheering us all on and helping us, helping us keep going. Um, Dennis and Kathy. Kathy stepped up and, and helped with Lynette and registration, and also Susan, and um, I know a couple other ladies were, were helping Lynette and registration, which was so nice, because, um, again, if I had tried to do registration, it, we would have had kids running everywhere. We'd had no idea who they were, so so thankful for Kathy and Lynette and all the other ladies who helped in registration. Um, also, the whole congregation, just want to thank you all for giving and uh, you know, without your funds, we couldn't do so much that we try to do here as a church. And also for just your encouragement and inviting different grandchildren and children, that kind of thing. Um, also, some ladies who showed up to help in the kitchen yesterday. Uh, Roger and Sue, no, Roger's not a lady, but <laughs> Roger, saw Roger show up yesterday. And then also Sue and Beth Butler over here and I'm a Jean um, and Sharon Campbell. And I think that's my whole list, and I know I forgot people, so I'm so sorry if you are one of the people I forgot. But I just, just wanted to say thank you, and if I did forget you, I thank you even more for uh, accepting my apology. <laughs> but thank you so much to everybody who helped out, and I hope you got a good nap this afternoon and yesterday afternoon, and I'm ready to do it again next year. <laughs> so, also, one more thing. Thomas, welcome. So glad to have you. If you haven't met Thomas yet, he's really friendly. He doesn't bite. He likes to smile and talk and stuff. So go up and, and meet him, talk to him. He's a great guy. And we're so thankful for already getting to work and, and leading singing. So, so thankful for that and so glad to have you here. All right. If you haven't already, open your Bible to the book of Exodus. I saw on the, the sermon slide today that we had the reading from from Dennis's sermon this morning, and then for mine, it just had Exodus, like just, just the whole book. And so turn to Exodus if you're not there. We are going to be reading a good bit out of Exodus. Um, so in the beginning of the book of Exodus, we have this, this intense showdown between God and Pharaoh and the other Egyptian gods over the fate of the Israelites. Now, obviously, uh, you probably know that the Israelites were God's chosen people, so they are God's people. But at this point in their history, they are enslaved to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt, which is the most powerful nation on earth at this time. So he's the most powerful man on earth. He has God's people enslaved. 
And God's not going to stand for that. So if you've ever read this, this, if you've ever read this section of Exodus, you know that it really is one of those sections where you can't wait to turn the page to see what's coming next because it's just really interesting. Because this, this Pharaoh guy is, is a really bad man. If you're reading through the Bible, starting in Genesis, going through Exodus, he's the worst man that we've encountered so far. So he's a really bad guy. And as you're reading through this, you might be tempted to ask the question, who is really calling the shots here? Is it actually God or is it Pharaoh? Because if it is God, then why does everything that happens in this section of Scripture happen? Why does God allow it to happen? Why are his own people slaves? And and why does this showdown become so violent and intense? And, And maybe most important for us, as we're discussing tonight, is what God does here in this section of Scripture morally acceptable? If that question makes you feel uncomfortable... That's for good reason. But just let it stand for now. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Is what God does here morally acceptable? So what we're going to do tonight is um, I was trying to figure out how to format this particular sermon. It's kind of a different type of sermon. We're going to be answering a pretty specific question, trying to to understand something from the Bible. So I I was looking up stuff, trying to figure out how to format this. And I found this this graph that is like the storyline, the typical storyline plot for different stories. So if you're writing a story, you have the problem or the goal, and then you have the rising action and the climax, the falling action, the resolution, what happens with the problem or the goal. So what we're going to do tonight is just kind of follow this plot line with our study and begin with our problem and then work our way up to the climax and then have our resolution at the end. So let's begin first with our problem. Look at Exodus chapter 3. Verses 19 and 20 to begin. Exodus 3, 19 and 20. This is the first glimpse at our problem. God is speaking. He says, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So like I said, this is, this is the first glimpse at our problem. God says that he will not let you go. He's, he's saying he won't let my people, the people of Israel, go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So then God says, I will compel him by a mighty hand. It's the first glimpse of our problem. But let's zoom in a little bit more. Look at chapter 4, next chapter, verse 21. Exodus 4, verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. The problem's coming into focus a little bit more. He says, I will harden his heart. Look a few chapters later, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Chapter 7, verses 2 and 3 of Exodus. God is speaking to Moses, and he says, You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. This brings up really big questions about our free will. God says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, does that mean that he overrides Pharaoh's controls? Does does he take the wheel of Pharaoh's heart and force him to sin? And if he does that, if he did it then, could he do it now with us? And if he did do it now with us, if he took us and, and forced us of no choice of our own to sin, then how could he be a fair and just and loving God? The fair, just, and loving God that we see presented in the scriptures. So hopefully you can see the problem as it's developing. God says, I will harden his heart. So our question is, if he could do it then, could he do it now? And if he did do it then, does he do it now? And then what does that mean for our lives? So that's our problem. We're going to build up with some rising action, going through the plagues and seeing how this develops, then a climax and then resolution. So what does it mean and what does it mean for us? And and what does this story tell us about how God interacts with evil and with evil people at other times in history? as well as in our own lives. Now, to answer all of those questions, we have to read through the story, we have to read through it in order, and we have to read through it slowly. Because if we don't do that, we run the, we run the risk of missing the experience that the author wants us to go through in this text. In other words, we, we run the risk of missing the entire point. So let's do it. Let's walk through this account here in Exodus slowly and in order and try to think through what God, through Moses, is trying to communicate to us in this text. So let's begin first with our first uh, rising action thing and hopefully solving our problem. 
We have to start somewhere. So notice that in those three texts that we just read, Exodus 3, Exodus 4, Exodus 7, they're all in the future tense, right? So God says, I will stretch out my hand. I will harden his heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So in each of those three cases, God is speaking of something in the future. He's prophesying. He's telling Moses, I will do this thing. Now, beginning in Exodus chapter 7, verses 10 through 13, we actually dive into the fray. So look there, Exodus 7, beginning in verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So here's what's really interesting. With this phrase that translated in this text, was hardened, here in Exodus 7, verse 13, it's not actually a passive verb in the Hebrew. So if you're reading from the English Standard Version, which is what I'm reading from, it's translated was hardened, which in English is the passive form. But in Hebrew, it's actually what's called a stative verb, which basically means that it doesn't tell us anything about who is performing this action. So that's, that's what all you need to get from this. This verb, it, when you read was hardened in English, it, it can seem like somebody else is hardening Pharaoh's heart. But actually, this verb in the Hebrew doesn't give any kind of indication about what is actually happening here and who is actually hardening Pharaoh's heart. So that's really important, right? As hopefully you can see. And we're, we're going to notice a pattern developing along these lines as we go through. So for now, just remember, when you read was hardened, the, the best translation for that probably is became hardened. Because became hardened really doesn't give an indication as to who is doing the hardening. So Pharaoh's heart became hardened. Remember that as we go through. Look at a little bit later on in chapter 7, verses 20, and 20, uh, 20 through 23. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the, the fish in the, in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. I think that would get your attention if you're Pharaoh. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. So notice in this text, we have yet another plague, another awful plague. But Pharaoh's heart remains hardened. So whatever happened in the first plague is still in place here in this plague. Next, look at Exodus chapter 8, verses 13 through 15. Next chapter, this is in the middle of the plague of frogs. If you have Bible, uh, if your Bible has headings in it, you're probably seeing that we're just going through the plagues here. Exodus 8, 13 through 15, the frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Drop down a verse, verse 17. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. Next plague. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. That's where our our sermon title comes from tonight. They're recognizing this is something different, right? This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. As you can see, this is very much a pattern here in this section of Exodus. Over and over and over again, Pharaoh's heart is being hardened, whether it's was hardened or Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And we're going to see in a minute, we have yet another pattern emerge. So look now at verse 24 here in Exodus 8. It says, There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Drop down to verse 28. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses says, so notice he's, he's telling them they can go worship. Then Moses says, behold, I am going out from you and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Pharaoh has gone back on his word in this process before. We didn't read that, but we're reading the second time. He's going back on his word yet again. So Moses went out from Pharaoh, prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, 
But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. We read that because I want you to see how selfish, how, how self-driven and how dishonest and how callous this man, this, this Pharaoh, this Egyptian king is. Because that's, that's going to be, become very important as we keep going through these texts. Notice the next chapter, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And the next day, the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. It's a difference there, right? And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Pharaoh cannot take a hint. There is an obvious and clear distinction between what's happening with the Israelites and what's happening with the Egyptians, right? It's pretty obvious. All of our livestock are gone. Their livestock are still alive. So there seems to be a pretty obvious difference as to what's happening. And it seems to point to a pretty obvious conclusion that the God of the Israelites is actually in charge. But Pharaoh hardens his heart to that truth. Look at uh, our next point, our next spot on this plot line. Chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Then, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils, so they have boils. The boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. All of these Egyptians have boils. They're having a, a really bad time, right? But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now, notice that there's, there's a really big shift here. This is the first time in the, in the actual narrative that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, before any of this happens, back in the first verses we read, we read that God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But now in the actual narrative, the the things that are actually happening, this is the first time where God actually acts upon Pharaoh's heart. Up to this point, it's been Pharaoh hardened his own heart, or it was hardened. So this is the first time he explicitly acts on Pharaoh's heart. So there's there's a big shift here. Notice the the next uh, plague, chapter 9, verse 34, beginning. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them. Twice here, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and now also his servants. So we're seeing this pattern every time in in these plagues. Look at the end of chapter 10, verses 24 through 27. This is in the middle of the plague of darkness. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. He wants some insurance that they're going to come back, in other words. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take of them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But... The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Again here, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, so it seems from the text that we've read so far that to some extent, both God and Pharaoh are involved in this hardening of Pharaoh's heart, right? It seems that they are both involved to some extent. Look at chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, so it's God once again talking to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. He says, this is why Pharaoh is not going to listen to you so that everybody can see my wonders, my miracles. They can tell that there's something different about your God. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Even in the face of miracle after miracle after miracle, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And here, God says that he is the one doing it. So, let's move to our climax. And notice this graph that we have of the ten plagues and what they have to say about what happened with Pharaoh's heart. In the first plague, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The second plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Third plague, his heart was hardened. Fourth, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Fifth, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Sixth, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Seventh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Eighth, God announces that he has hardened Pharaoh's heart. Ninth, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And tenth, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Notice that in these plagues, in these reactions or these actions upon Pharaoh's heart, there's a distinct shift, right? In plagues one through five, we either have that stated verb that doesn't tell us who is doing the action, who is actually hardening Pharaoh's heart, or we have Pharaoh himself hardening his heart. It explicitly says that Pharaoh hardens his heart. But then at plague number six, there's a distinct shift, right? And it begins to say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
Now, what's really interesting is that on the seventh plague, which, as you can see, doesn't say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. On the seventh plague, once again, the text says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But there's a phrase following that phrase that I think is really important. So turn back to to chapter 9 of Exodus. Exodus 9, verses 34 through 35. Because there's a phrase following that phrase that I think is really important for our discussion. Exodus 9, 34 and 35. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased... He sinned yet again and hardened his heart. So there's our phrase, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people of Israel go just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Notice that here we actually have two different statements. First, we have that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then second, referring to the same event, we have this phrase that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. So this seems to indicate that the other uses of this ambiguous stated verb, the the verb that doesn't tell us who's doing the action, it seems to indicate that it was actually Pharaoh who was doing this action in the first five plagues and then also in the seventh plague. So it appears that God did not force Pharaoh to do evil or to be evil. Pharaoh made that choice himself. Now, this is just theorizing. This is just us thinking out loud. But we, maybe we can theorize that at some point, Pharaoh crossed a line that was invisible to us or is invisible to us, but is known to God. And after he crossed that line, God knew that he would never return. So this is a line that's invisible to us, visible to God. Sometime in between plague number five, plague number six, God knows that Pharaoh crossed that line. And so he steps in and hardens his heart. So let's move to our resolution. Let's talk a little bit more about this. What does this mean for us? Look at Romans chapter nine. We're we're done reading from Exodus. We're going to read from Romans for the rest of our time. Romans chapter nine, because here in Romans, Paul references this event. And he applies it to us, to New Testament Christians, people who live under the new covenant. Romans chapter 9, and we're going to begin in verses 17 and 18. Paul quotes here from Exodus. Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16. He says that the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So Paul is saying that God actually played on the heartstrings of history to bring Pharaoh up. So he's saying that this is the purpose behind Pharaoh's rule, his position, his power, his prestige. This is, when you think about it, this is really breathtaking. And it has incredible ramifications. God says, I brought you up for this specific purpose. I made you stand on the stage of history for this purpose. So you would lose. I brought you up so I could show you, as the most powerful man on earth, I could show you how weak you are compared to me. That's what he's saying, right? God says, I brought you up for this purpose so that they could see my power and how I deal with you. So think about that. How many people are like that in our world today? How many people have these these positions of power, prestige, prosperity, popularity, and they don't realize that they're there, not because of anything they've done necessarily, but, but so God can show everybody else or show anybody else how powerful he is, how great he is. But returning to our thoughts here, God's grand plan was the entire purpose behind the way that Pharaoh's life turned out, right? So God's plan, God's actually in control of Pharaoh's life. And to some extent, God says, I raised you up so I could show you my power. I raised you up so I could show everybody else how powerful I am. So that's why this is in the Bible, to show us that God triumphs over evil, that he is powerful enough to win. He can do whatever he wants. But there's a really important note that we need to make from Romans chapter 9. And that is this. Paul is not saying that that God hardens people for no reason. It's not that God's hardening of hearts is arbitrary. Like, Like he looks at us and he says, poof, you're going to have a hard heart. And poof, you're not going to have a hard heart. That's that's not how this works. In context, Paul is saying you don't have a right to argue with God about this. That is not your right. That's not our place. We don't get to argue with God about whether he is just or not. So sometimes atheists will will propose hypotheticals that go something like this. So let's say that your God actually does exist, that the God of the Bible exists, and that he did these things that are recorded in the Bible. I think that those actions are morally unjust. Now, I don't say this to uh, to put atheists down unjustly or anything like that. I just it's just this, that's a hypothetical that gets put forward pretty often from atheists. So they say that if your God exists and he does these things, those things are morally unjust. Now, obviously, they're not going to care what Paul has to say 
unless we convince them that God exists and that the Bible is from him first. But for us, what we need to take away is that we don't have a right to question God's goodness. We don't have a right to question God's moral or virtuous goodness or badness. That's not our place. If I think God is wrong, I'm wrong. There's, there's no version of the story where I get to say that God made a mistake or that something is his fault or that he is at fault. His actions are not subject to my review. And that probably sounds harsh, right? Like that's, that's pretty strong. But it's so important for us to learn and to apply to our lives. Because when we gain that perspective, we gain an essential dose of humility. Like us looking up at God and saying, I don't think that what you did here, I don't think that's okay. That's like an ant looking up at us and saying, you know what, y- you are wrong. Like you, you don't get to walk down the sidewalk. That's not your right. That's how it is with God. Like Isaiah says that we're grasshoppers to God, like grasshoppers to God. Now, I would think that that maybe is just the, a figure of speech to say, like, maybe you couldn't get to a, a lower thing. You couldn't think of something that's lower than God, than grasshoppers to illustrate that. We are so far beneath God. Like us compared to an ant is nothing compared to how far beneath we, we are to God. I know that sentence didn't make sense, but hopefully you got it. <laughs> so that's the point. That's what Paul is saying here in Romans 9. Look at uh, verse 14. He says, what shall we say to them? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. And then drop down to verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Like we're saying, that's not your right. Well, what is molded? Say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, he's the creator. We're the created. He can do whatever he wants to do. That's Paul's point here in Romans 9. And, and to a large extent, that seems to be the entire point of the whole Exodus saga that, that develops surrounding Pharaoh's heart. So God can do whatever he wants. But the question is, what does he do? Because God can do whatever he wants. But what seems evident from the text in Romans 9, as well as the texts in Exodus and the texts in the rest of the Bible, is that God can do whatever he wants, but he doesn't harden people arbitrarily. It's not for no reason. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the, the last verse we'll turn to tonight. 2 Thessalonians 2. We're going to read beginning in verse 10, going through verse 12. Because here in 2 Thessalonians, we find something that's similar to hardening. In fact, I, I would say that it may be referring to the same thing as hardening, but in different terms. So 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning at the end of, chapter, uh, of, of verse 10, Paul is speaking of a group, and he says that they refused to love the truth, and so be saved. So this group refused to love the truth, so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a reason for hardening. There's a reason for a strong delusion. Pharaoh earned it. These people here in 2 Thessalonians 2 earned it. Like Paul says, they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, because of that action, God sends them a strong delusion. So, we'll go back to that in a second. But let's recap really quickly. When human evil goes unchecked, bad things happen. And bad people can sometimes become monsters. So that's what Pharaoh serves as an example for us now, today, as. When bad people become worse, they can become monsters. Pharaoh embodies this this strange and tragic turn in the human heart where that can take place when when a a person or a society chooses their own values or their own well-being over another person's or another society's. Pharaoh is what we get when an entire nation redefines good and evil without God. That's what happens. You get in Egypt building its wealth and its security on the backs of oppressed and abused and enslaved Israelites. This is what happens when a nation redefines good and evil apart from God. This is a, a horrific situation. And it's an example for us of what the sin condition that infects all of humanity can do, right? The author of Exodus is showing us that Pharaoh was responsible for the evil in his heart. And at a clear point in his story, after plague number five, he he crossed a point of no return. So at this point, God repurposes this vessel, as as Paul says in Romans chapter 9. He repurposes this vessel for his own good purposes. Now the point of the story is not to tell us that God engineers evil. Instead, it's a cautionary warning to us, to the readers, saying, don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your own heart and cross that line. Because strange things happen in the human heart and mind when evil is allowed to run rampant. 
So we, we need to say, right, that God always will offer us chances to turn back, right? God is a graceful God. And one thing that we can say along those lines is, or ask ourselves is, would I have given Pharaoh that many chances? This is, this is an incredibly evil man. And he's, he's resisting these obvious miracles over and over and over again. God keeps giving him chance after chance after chance. But sometimes a person can cement themselves in a destructive path and get to the point where there is no point of return. God can and sometimes does allow our evil to destroy us. But a piece of good news is that if that last sentence scares you, then you're not Pharaoh, right? If you're asking that sobering question about yourself, then your heart is not hard. It's not past the point of no return. And it wants to do the right thing. So as we conclude tonight, as we draw this to a close, let's talk about six conclusions about hardening. Really quickly, six conclusions about hardening. First, hardening does not change your mind. Hardening does not change your mind. It keeps you from changing your mind. Hardening doesn't make you do things you don't want to do. Instead, you're stuck in the thing that you do want to do. That's inherent in the very concept of hardening as it's presented in the Bible. You continue in the direction you were already going. So it's not like I'm, I'm walking into a church building and I think, wow, I, I think I really want to be saved. And God says, no. And he zaps you and all of a sudden you're like, wow, I, I really don't want to be saved. This isn't the salvation that I'm looking for. That's not how this works. Hardening doesn't change your mind. Second, hardening doesn't necessarily involve salvation. It may include salvation. It might be that someone is hardened to the gospel, but it can also be about a general attitude of rebellion toward God. For example, Pharaoh might be in heaven today. For all we know, we have no idea, right? So his hardening had nothing to do with his salvation. His hardening, he disobeyed some of God's commands, but it didn't determine his eternal destination. So hardening doesn't, hardening doesn't necessarily have anything to do with salvation. Third, those who are truly hardened deserve it. Now, what I mean is that God is not unjust in any of his actions. There is no way for us to know if he hardened someone today, right? We don't have that kind of insight. But if he has, we can know that it's not unjust. Salvation can never be earned, but this type of hardening is always earned. Fourth, hardening is not necessarily complete or permanent. If this isn't the case, then why did Pharaoh have to be hardened multiple times? And if it isn't the case, then why did he let them go in the end? So, hardening is not necessarily complete or permanent. Someone who is hardened now may not be forever. Next conclusion, and this one's related to the last one. In the Bible, it's not a choice between mercy and hardening. So, what we see in the scripture is that God hardens specific people for specific reasons. But it's not as though someone being hardened means that they're chosen for eternal condemnation. So, in Romans 9, Paul seems to be putting forth the argument that God has hardened a large part of Israel for a season. But if you look, if you're still there in Romans 9, look at chapter 11, verse 23. He says, and even they, these are the Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. So this is not a choice between mercy and hardening on, a, on, a, on an ultimate level. It's not a choice between the two. The two can coexist in the same person at different times. So they can be grafted in. Hopefully, that can give us hope. And last conclusion, and I hate to say this one. But any of us can become hardened. I can become hardened. I can rebel against God and harden my own heart against Him. I can also harden my heart to the extent that a, a judicial hardening will come from God in my own life. And the same thing can happen to you. So, as we conclude tonight, I ask you to ask with me, is my heart soft right now before God? Are my defenses down before God? Am I like the clay that says to, to him, God, I want, I want whatever is in between you and me, whatever might keep me from yielding to your molding, I want it gone. Because I want you to be able to control my life. Because it, it's really, you know, it's fine and dandy. It's easy to talk about God's hardening of random people or of hypothetical people or of ancient people. But I have to take care of this guy, right? I can harden my own heart. And so can you. But please don't. If you have something that you need to make right publicly tonight, won't you do it as we stand and as we sing?